So, there are many games which have evolution as an important part of character progression. From Pokemon, where evolution is expressed as a kind of metamorphosis, with one thing changing to another with enough experience, to 2K games' relatively well-received game Evolve, where the monsters eat prey to evolve and become more powerful. These, of course, aren't scientifically accurate examples of evolution. To find that, we need to look somewhere a bit more alien. Hello everybody and welcome to the Science of Where today we're taking a look at the science behind the Spore series. This 2008 game was released by Maxis, the same company behind the original Sim series before being acquired by EA in 1997 and is unfortunately among 8 developers they've acquired and then closed down. Throughout Spore you control a species of alien creatures and control their evolution through 5 main stages, those being the cellular, creature, tribal, civilization, and space stages. We could look at the self stage, but Maxis made a greater attempt to be fun than biologically accurate, so there's not that much to talk about. The creature stage on the other hand is far more biologically accurate, so this is the stage we'll be taking a look at today, looking at how it depicts evolution and the basics of genetic inheritance. Now, given we don't have access to all the biological processes going on within our spore creation, we'll be focusing on the physical attributes and abilities of our species. In biology, we call these physical attributes the species phenotype. An individual's phenotype is a set of observable characteristics for an individual. These physical characteristics are the result of a mixture of two factors, the first being their genes, and the second being the environment in which they inhabit. When we look at evolution, it's split into two main categories, microevolution and macroevolution. Macroevolution are genetic changes above the species level, looking at different species and seeing the differences between them and their common ancestry. Microevolution, on the other hand, is the name given to evolution and evolutionary processes which occur within species. Given that through sport you evolve and play as one species throughout the game, we'll be focusing on microevolution and what causes variation within species. The main thing you need to know when it comes to evolution is that it's not an individual that evolves, it's the whole population. And for this evolution to occur, there must be polymorphism present in that population, which means that there are multiple alleles for genes present in the population. These alleles are variations of genes. These variations can be found at the same position as the original gene in the genome, meaning that it's on the same chromosome on the same gene locus. These alleles are representative of the inherited genotype from each parent, and the alleles come from the phenotype of each parent. These are best shown in categoric phenotypes such as eye and hair colour. In Spore, you can change the species phenotype every generation, by finding a mate and then producing an egg. During this, you'll have a decent amount of customization, being able to change the colour of your creature, their body shape, and even their physical abilities by giving them natural weapons. This produces a slight issue, because the creature you create during this may end up looking completely different from its parents, which isn't really how evolution works. Now, the chance of an offspring taking on one of its parents' alleles depends on two factors. The first is if the allele is homozygous or heterozygous. A homozygous allele occurs when both parents share the same allele at the same gene point on the chromosome, and heterozygous alleles occur when two alleles differ but are still at the same point on the gene locus. If the allele is homozygous, then it's easy, because the offspring will inherit the allele regardless. But if the allele is heterozygous, then another factor comes into play, if the allele is dominant, recessive, or co-dominant. In terms of genetic dominance, the key factor is if the gene codes for a working or broken protein. In these cases, the gene which codes for a working protein will usually be prominent due to the broken protein not working, and coming from an evolutionary standpoint, it may not survive and get passed on to the next generation. In code dominance, neither allele can mask the expression of the other allele, the most common example being in the expression of the ABO blood group. In this case, both blood types A and B are expressed. All of these are possible at set probabilities for those two parents, and that's what causes the genetic allele frequency seen throughout nature. Let's take a look at eye colour and put it on a Punnett square. Punnett squares allow us to see the possible genetic outcomes with set allele variations. So, if we had two parents that carry two possible alleles for eye colour, now of course, eye colour isn't controlled by one gene on its own, but let's say it is for the purpose of this example. Let's say that we had a parent with blue eyes and a parent with brown eyes. Blue eyes are a recessive allele and brown eyes are a dominant allele. In this case, the brown eyed parent also carries a recessive gene for blue eyes, so the Punnett square would look like this. 
In this case, there's an equal opportunity of the offspring being blue-eyed or brown-eyed. But you also have to remember that this happens for multiple genes which code for different features of the phenotype, which results in the level of variation seen throughout the animal kingdom. This does again bring up a slight issue with spore, whereby all spores of the same generations are identical in appearance besides size, but they can offer offspring which look completely different. In sport, these are classified as a completely different species. Obviously, different species don't just pop up overnight. Instead, they occur over many generations and are normally caused by a divergence in the population, which causes the allele frequency to drift. There are four categories which can cause changes in allele frequency. These are genetic mutations, natural selection, random genetic drift, and gene flow. Okay, so for DNA mutations, you're going to need a little bit of context on how genes work. So, first of all, DNA within genes can be split into two groups. Coding DNA, known as exons, and non-coding DNA, known as introns. Now, believe it or not, 99% of human DNA is non-coding introns. When the gene is expressed, the DNA is transcribed into pre-mRNA. This is single-stranded and contains both the introns and exons. Then, the non-coding introns are removed to produce the true mRNA, which then gets translated into a protein molecule using a ribosome with subsequent group of three DNA bases, known as codons, each coding for a single amino acid. There are 20 amino acids in total, and they all differ in terms of their shape, size, and charge. A combination of these amino acids are used to make up the protein molecule, but no matter what, the last codon will always be one of three stop codons. Following this, the amino acid sequence then folds three times to form a protein. DNA mutations cause changes in allele frequencies by changing the amino acid triplet sequence, which causes the expression of the gene as a protein to change. There are three types of DNA mutation in this coding DNA. Same-sense mutations, non-sense mutations, and missense mutations. Same-sense mutations are often referred to as silent mutations and make up a majority of DNA mutations. These happen most commonly on the third codon position and normally result in no change to the amino acid produced from the codon, and as such, won't result in a change in the allele frequency within the population. Missense mutations are the opposite of same-sense mutations. In these cases, a mutation on the first, second, or third codon position results in a change in the amino acid. This change occurs due to the new sequence, and causes a change in the folding of the protein, which depends on how different the new amino acid sequence is to the old one. And finally, we have nonsense mutations. These mutations cause the DNA sequence to be cut off by changing one of the codons to be a stop codon. These can cause some serious issues in the protein produced, due to it being shorter than its intended length, and this will result in the protein not folding as it should, and therefore being pretty much useless for its purpose. So those are DNA mutations, and they account for a relatively small number of the changes to allele frequencies in populations. The other three evolutionary factors have a greater significance, starting with the most well-known factor, natural selection. When it comes to natural selection, the phrase of the day is survival of the fittest, but there is a bit more than that for natural selection to occur. So, let's go through these and see which can apply to our sport creations. First of all, there needs to be phenotypic variation in the population, and we do kind of see this in spore, as although all creatures have the same features, they do vary in size, so we could consider them to have phenotypic variation. Secondly, there needs to be a variation in the fitness of the population, as this ensures there's variation in both the mating ability and fertilizing ability of individuals in the population. And finally, there's inheritance, as there needs to be consistent relationship for traits between your parents and their offspring, which is independent of environmental effects. Out of these three conditions, inheritance is the one which Spore definitely doesn't adhere to, due to the slight issue of it needing to be fun, because it's still, you know, a game. And as such, you have a great level of control over your creature. You can change its number of limbs, their lengths, the species' mouth types, and even if the species is a carnivore or herbivore, dependent on if it's a Tuesday. So after natural selection, we have allele flow. This is pretty simple, so I won't say much about it. In allele flow, immigration between populations causes new alleles to be introduced into genes, which increases the genetic diversity of a population. And finally, we have random genetic drift. This is pretty much just what it sounds like. Random acts of nature which cause the allele frequencies in a population to change. 
One example of this is the founder effect. In the founder effect, a small group breaks off from the main population to found a new population in a different habitat. This new population may have a smaller genetic diversity compared to its original population, causing the allele frequency to shrink as the new population grows and adapts to the new conditions in the area. So there we are, those are the methods by which evolution can occur within a species, and Spore does a decent job at showing the evolutionary processes whilst always trying to make the gameplay engaging first and foremost, allowing you to see how species would evolve with time, even if the timescale is significantly shorter than in the real world. Maxis did a great job at showing the variation that occurs within and between species, while still making this 2008 game a ton of fun, probably because it's not the most scientifically accurate. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to like and subscribe, and if there are any topics you'd like to see me cover in future videos, then comment them down below. But until then, this has been the Science of Sport. I'll see you next time.